Morning, or evening, or spreading a sense, which everybody back along with us here with our Word Awakening and our Sunday Sermon, and look forward to continuing in the uh, 37th Psalm here today, be looking at verses 21 and 22 uh, here this uh, this morning, and it is great to have everybody back with us here. And uh, by way of announcements, because uh, we do have some changes, if you notice here, that wasn't a midweek study, I'm sorry, a, uh, a weekend study. Uh, that was uh, that was uploaded here because we are um, making some changes, cutting down a little bit with uh, with all that we have going on with the Bible Institute and Temperance Awakening and our family getting ready to move uh, to uh, New York State here in uh, just a few months. As busy as we are, then also like in my home life, helping you know homeschool my daughter and uh, everything. We're going to go to uh, having a Sunday sermon like we are now and having a midweek study, which is why I mistakenly said midweek study. We're going to cut everything else out, I guess, for, uh, for this time anyway. Uh, this will probably go until we move to, uh, to New York State. You know, we might change some things around there uh, then again, so we'll see how things go. So, of course, a big part of us, you know, doesn't want to do that, you know, because we had also just gone back again, preaching in voice and sign language, you know, was having, you know, a midweek prayer meeting and, uh, and so forth. But for now, though, we're going to have this, a Sunday sermon, and, a, and a, um, our midweek study is actually what we're going to call revival preaching. That'll usually be done, like, in the middle of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And we'll also take, also, and have a special time of prayer there, uh, you know, praying for revival and so forth, and for, you know, all the needs and everything that we're aware of. And, uh, and like, we were in, like, on our weekend study, like how we were in the book of Haggai, we're going to continue that uh, with our, uh, you know, with our... Uh, uh, re midweek revival preaching, and so uh, that's where we'll continue that series. And so, as I said, you know, we do, uh, you know, a, pa a part of us does apologize that we did cut a couple of things out, uh, but you know, we were uh, so busy, you know, that was really taking a toll on us. And also, like I said, a big thing I'm doing also is I'm preparing more classes, you know, for our Bible Institute and actually seminary. I'm also working like on a master's, getting a master's degree. A program together for our uh, well, what will be a seminary. It'll be Word Bible and Student Theological Seminary. You know, we'll be having that pretty soon as well. You know, the uh, the seminary, and so you know, very busy doing all that. You know, I have to mention writing books. You know, typing. You know, typing up books that I've written longhand. You know, and a number of things, and so we're extremely busy. Like I've said before, I'm actually praying that God might give me a would give me a partner if it's His will, somebody to help us out with all that we're doing here. And so uh, we have made uh, made that change, though. But we will still be having our word, like I said, Bible and Institute of Temperance Awakening. Those things will still be uh, going on here. You know, our lectures and you know teaching and things over there. We'll still be having that as well. And so, just wanted to uh, I wanted to give everybody uh, that update so you keep praying for us, so that we would follow the Lord's will and just do what the Lord would have us to do. Um, like my daughter, though, will be getting out of homeschooling here in about, a, in about a month or so. And so whenever that ends, we might go back to picking up on a couple of those other things, like on our preaching and voice and sign language, like and or our midweek prayer meeting. You know, we'll see how things go in, uh, you know, kind of in weeks to come. But for the time being, you know, that's, uh, that's at least a temporary schedule that, you know, we're going to have to be on for at least a month, you know, possibly, until we move to New York State and we get settled down up there, you know, and we'll see how things are going. So you pray for us, though, that we would be obedient. And so uh, that's all the announcements that we have now going into our uh, prayer time. Actually, tomorrow, finally, my mother-in-law will be having another MRI done. That's scheduled for, you know, tomorrow, Monday, at the present time of this recording. And so you pray for Jimmy Tyler that she would get that back surgery scheduled soon. Let's do remember all the sick in body, all those that stand in need. And of course, as many of you probably saw on the news, there was a shooting uh, like in, in Buffalo, you know, western New York, where ten pe the last I saw, ten people were killed and three were injured. And, uh, and that's, like I said, in western New York, that's about uh, three hours or so from where we're moving. But uh, the, the shooter, though, who did that stuff is actually from the Binghamton area where we're moving to. And so uh, we'll take and pray for all of those victims, as well as that young man who was only 18 years old. He was a racist, I know uh, they say now. 
uh, he, he'd actually make threats and things like that online, like toward African American people in the past, and you know, he was into the Ku Klux Klan and, you know, white supremacy and a lot of that stuff. So we'll take and pray for, uh, for, uh, for him and for his soul. I do believe somebody who would do that is demon-possessed. You can disagree if you want to. I mean, I won't break fellowship if you disagree, but I don't believe a man like that's just evil. I believe an individual like that is possessed with demons. That's going to take the lie, especially, you know, just a guy who had the heart that he had. But we're going to pray for him, though. Pray for his family. Pray that the God would convict him and save him. You know, God can save anybody. As I said, also certainly praying for the victims. You know, praying that the Lord would, uh, I know it's difficult to see a good outcome, but, you know, maybe people could wake up, you know, after things like this happen. Say, hey, you know, maybe we need to do things the Bible way. Um, you know, we live in a wicked society, but, uh, you know, we'll be praying for all those people. You know, our heart goes out to them. We certainly give them our condolences, praying for all of those, uh, all of the victims of, of that shooting and their families, and as well as for the, uh, I can't remember his name, I, I meant to, uh, meant to try to get those people, all the victims and that young man's names, if a lot of released, I know they re did release that young man's name, but I can't remember it, but we'll be praying for him and his family, you know, that uh, God would uh, get a hold of them, or whatever, I don't know, his family situation, you know, if he was raised to be racist or what, but you know, just praying that, you know, they get, everybody gets whatever they need spiritually in that situation. Let's do pray one for another. Pray for revival, that God would be with each and every one of us, and God would give us that which we need. Amen. And so let's all just pray. Pray one for another, that uh, we've got to be with all those that are a sick in body, those that stand in need, or those that stand in need emotionally, spiritually, and financially, with whatever it might be. And we'll go to the Lord now in a word of prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the gifts of sin. Thank you for all that you've done, all the blessings that you've bestowed upon our hearts and upon our lives. And we're so thankful, Lord God, for our salvation and allowing us to meet here over the cyber waves to preach. Now, I just pray, Lord God, you'd bless your word. Just help us how to find the cross. And give us an unction from on high, Father. May every hindrance, every stumbling block, every demon of hell. And uh, maybe just have get an unction from on high, Lord God, and just preach in that way that would be pleasing unto you here uh, this morning. And we uh, pray for all the needs from my mother-in-law, Jenny Tyler, that you would uh, get this back surgery scheduled soon. And uh, for the uh, victims of the shooting in Buffalo, New York, that you would just comfort those families. I really can't comprehend or... Uh, what they're going through. I've never experienced anything like that in my life, but I pray that you touch them and help them in a mighty way. As well as uh, this shooter and his family, pray that you know you would convict his soul and uh, save him and, uh, you know, whatever his family stands in need of, that you would just touch them and their hearts and lives and uh, be with all those involved for all the law enforcement and everything dealing with that situation. I just pray that you touch them and guide them and uh, just uh, touch their hearts and help them. And uh, we pray for all the needs, Lord God, that our dear listeners have for the physical need, those that are on the bed of affliction, you know, those that are about to have procedures done, recovering from certain procedures, those that stand emotionally, spiritually, and financially. So I pray that you'd save the lost, heal the sick, and curse the discouraged, reclaim the backslid, and that you just work on hearts and souls, Lord, and revive our hearts. Uh, you know, like when 9-11 happened, you know, that's all what a lot of people were thinking there in churches. You know, this should lead to revival, and it should. You know, we just need to open our eyes and say what we need is a revival, just like this shooting in Buffalo. You know, we, uh, you know, we need revival. And I pray that people would just, you know, open their eyes and see. You know, we need to do, need to do things a biblical way. We need to get back to the Bible and need to revive our hearts. You know, like we think of Western New York over in that area. You know, that was a big sight, you know, of the, of the Second Great Awakening in the 1800s. And we just pray that that would come again. And just touch our hearts and our souls, you know, and just lead and guide and direct us in the way that you'd have us to go in our lives and our hearts. And just give us that which we need spiritually, you know, may we be a better Christian than we began this morning. And just to touch his Father and do that work, you know, that only you can do in us. And I thank you so much for answering prayer for the prayer that you answered for us. And I just pray that you continue to be with us and just use us all for your own glory. Because in Christ's blessing and we pray all these things. Giving him all the honor and glory because he's worthy of and him alone. Amen. Amen. And as we said there, we would just like to say we uh, thank God for answering prayer. It wasn't a really, what some people might not call a really, really big thing, but God answered a good prayer for our family, though. And we just want to publicly give him the honor, uh, glory, and praise for that. <clears throat> and uh, now getting into the Word of God, into the back, uh, back to the 37th Psalm, as we're about halfway through the, uh, the text here, uh, the chapter...
We'll be reading verses 21 and 22 of the 37th Psalm. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous sheweth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. And we'll ask the Lord to add his blessing to the reading of his word as we continue to preach this message, a contrast between the godly and the wicked. And our Father, we sure do love you this morning. We uh, thank you for the gifts of sin. Thank you so much, Lord God, for your word. Pray you to add your blessing to it. And just help us, Lord, as we try to preach, how to find the cross. Once again, ask that you may every hindrance of your stumble and walk every demon of hell. And just give us an unction from on high, and may we get help from your word here this morning. And we'll certainly be careful to give you honor, all the praise and all the glory for it all because you are that you alone. For it's in the blessed name of Jesus Christ we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. And so continuing our message here, a contrast between the godly and the wicked. And looking at the previous points that we had here. Uh, number one was an exhortation, an ex, I'm sorry, an exhibition of evildoers. Number two was an exhibition of the trusting. Uh, number three was an exhibition of the meek and evil. Number four, the evil will reap what they sow. Number five, the righteous are saved, the wicked broken. And then number six, the Lord knows the upright. And number seven, uh, the point that the last point that we gave last week, the wicked will perish, verse 20. And now we come to verses 21 and 22, which constitute our eighth point, a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. So now we got another verse here that's contrasting the wicked and the uh, righteous, and uh, there are quite a few things that we're going to pull out of these two verses here. And we didn't want to get into verses uh, 20, uh, sorry, verses uh, 23 and 24, uh, which uh, which have a lot that we're also going to be pulling a lot, a lot out of next week. And so the message that we have now here might uh, might go a little a little shorter than we normally would. But uh, we do have a lot here that we're going to pull from. We've got uh, four, four sub points here. In, uh, with these two verses. But looking at that, though, a contrast between the wicked and the righteous, because, you know, they are at opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, spiritually. You know, righteous people who are following God, trying to do God's will, versus wicked people who simply are not. And, you know, wicked people, that's, uh, that, that can be a large group there, as we always say. You know, that could be people who go to church, but they're not saved. You know, that could be people who are like Judas Iscariot, you know, who we talked about in our last uh, a Book of John class in chapter 17. That could be people who are just, you know, religious fakes, you know, so to speak. Or that could be people that are, you know, they don't go to church at all, that are just, you know, wicked and whatever, and they don't do anything to try to hide it. But nonetheless, though, there certainly is a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. They have a very different destination. And, uh, you know, they certainly have a very different... Uh, a very different relationship with God, you know, for lack of a better word, of course, really wicked people don't have a relationship with God. They have a, um, a try, I can't really think of a better word than that, but, you know, they have a very different, uh, a very different providence, right, the best way to put it. They have a very different providence, uh, you know, from God. And we see here, verse number 21, the first phrase, it says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. So the wicked borrow from people, and they don't pay it back. Letter A, the wicked are full of envy, because who does that? People that are envious, you know, people that are greedy, you know, people that just want more and more, and, you know, that certainly is a characteristic, you know, like of a wicked person. If you want to do, uh, if you want to do a test, a spiritual test for yourself, or, you know, maybe observing another, observing another person or whatever, you're interested, you know, in the spiritual condition of other people, you know, hopefully for the right reason, because, you know, you want to know how to pray for them or try to help them or whatever. But, uh, you know, wicked people are greedy. You know, wicked people are full of envy. You know, they're people that just want more and more, you know, of what the world has. You know, whereas a spiritual person is satisfied with God. You know, their joy comes from a spiritual life. You know, their satisfaction and everything they get, you know, it comes from their spiritual life with God. And I will look at a couple of verses here. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 4. Ecclesiastes 4, 4. Again, I considered all travail and every right work. 
that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. See, there are people who work right, and, you know, they, uh, you know, they get things, you know, whatever it is, you know, they might get, uh, you, you know, they get things physically and also spiritually, and then they're envied by their neighbor because their neighbor just wants what somebody else has. See, you know, that's, uh, as I said, that's a characteristic you know, like of a person that is just spiritually void. You know, people that just want more and more worldly things. You know, they want more and more, you know, worldly possessions, more and more material things. See, that's vanity. You know, and vexation of spirit. You know, that means it's of no, it's of no value. See, greedy people who just want worldly things, they're of no spiritual value. It doesn't go anywhere. You know, there is no real satisfaction in anything of the world because you always want more and more of it. See, it's just like an addiction. You know, just like a person, you know, is never satisfied with one drink of alcohol or one or one cigarette or dip of tobacco or, you know, one hit of, of marijuana or heroin or, or cocaine or whatever. They want more and more of it. That's just like with worldly things. You know, people are never satisfied with what they have. They want more and more of it. And, of course, there's a very, a pretty familiar verse, you know, that we have in the Word of God that talks about that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6. You now, the Bible, probably know what verse I'm going to here. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 10. Like it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now the first thing I want to look at there is actually the middle part of that verse. It says, which while some coveted after. And we've looked at this before when we first started this ministry back in 2020. You know, that was one of the first studies, I think, that, that, uh, that, that we did was talking about coveting and envy. And see here, and that's what, you know, being envious is, you know, or what being greedy is. You know, that's wanting what other people have. See, that's wrong. See, it's wrong to covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. Like, coveting, you know, might not sound like something all that bad. Well, you know, coveting, wanting what other people have. Uh, that, that's, just, that's just human nature. That's not really all that bad. But it's listed in the Ten Commandments with a number of other things that are very wicked. You know, it's listed like with, you know, thou shalt not kill, you know, thou shalt not steal, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. And like if you look at other, other places in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament alike, whenever, uh, you know, whenever the penmen of the Bible, you know, give a list of, of very serious sinful offenses like murder, adultery, fornication, you know, etc., etc. Envying is often listed with those things. Envying and covetousness. Because that shows how spiritually void a person is. And like, you know, there, there are people like that. I have relatives, you know, that are like that. You know, that, that they're consumed, you know, with envy and and greed. Like you go like you go drive around a wealthy neighborhood, you know, they'll they'll see some big, you know, house. Oh, I wish that was mine. You know, they'll see a nice car. I wish that was mine. And see that's ungodly. That's not spiritual whenever we just want more and more worldly possessions. And see going there to that first phrase, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, there, there are a couple of things we want to look at here. First of all, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says for the love of money. You know, I don't know a whole lot of wealthy Christians, but, you know, there are wealthy Christians that are out there. You know, it's not wrong to be wealthy. You know, it's simply not wrong, you know, you know to have things. You know, Job, you know, he was perfect and upright, but, you know, he was a wealthy man. And, you know, we see a couple of people like that in the Bible. It's simply not wrong to have things. It's not, you know, it's not sinful to be wealthy, you know, in, in itself, you know, if we're, you know, using our wealth, you know, for the Lord's honor and for the Lord's glory, I believe. That's actually also, I know, in the book of, uh, yeah, that's actually like also like uh, verse 18 of this very chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
you know, wealthy people, you know, can certainly use their wealth for the Lord's honor and glory. You know, they can support missionaries. You know, they can give money to, you know, to missions and to ministries and, you know, to the poor. You know, they can, you know, they can certainly be of a great help to the church. You know, it's simply not wrong to be wealthy. But the love of money, though, is the root of all evil. See, and that's another thing. It just doesn't say for the love of money is evil. It says the root of all evil. See, that's why God warns so much, like against covetousness and being greedy. Because that's the root of all evil. Because, see, being, being greedy and wanting more and more things, that'll cause you to do really bad stuff. I mean, how many, how many stories have you heard, like, about preachers and preachers' wives and all who stole money from the church? You know, we hear stories about that all the time. You know, how many times have you heard about, you know, business owners and people, you know, being guilty, you know, for stealing money and, you know, so forth? You hear about those things all the time. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Whenever you love money... You know, i.e., whenever you just want more and more, you know, worldly possessions, you know, just like the verse we read in Psalm 37, verse 21, you know, that'll make, that'll cause you to lose your character. You know, when all you want is more and more material things. And spiritually, that shows somebody that's not satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our joy should be in the ministry. You know, our joy is in the things of God. And the closer and closer you get to God, the less and less, you know, you'll care about the things of the world. You know, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said. You know, in his epistles, you know, I count all things but dung so that I can win Christ. You know, I gladly, you know, give up the things of the world, you know, to win, you know, to win people for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, where your treasure is, you know, up there will your heart be also. See, a person that has their treasure and their heart in the things of the world, you know, is a person that is that is spiritually void. You know, they're not they're not having they're not having joy and satisfaction to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, they have erred from the faith. You know, that causes people to err from the faith. Because you're not living the right life of faith whenever you just want more and more and more, you know, material things. You know, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Because, see, that's exactly what that'll do. You know, worldly things will just cause you lots of sorrow when you just want more and more of that. It'll leave you disappointed. Because, once again, you know, how many, you know, how many stories have you heard about, you know, millionaires, you know, that end up depressed and everything? It's because they're addicted to worldliness and being addicted to, you know, being addicted to worldly things. That's always just going to leave you depressed. That's never going to satisfy you. And so now we go back to the 37th Psalm. See here the first part of it there. The wicked are full of envy. In verse 21, but the righteous you at the mercy and give it. See, let it be righteous people are full of charity. See what a contrast that is. You know, those are two things. See, like at the opposite end of the spectrum. See, wicked people are full of envy. Let's see, righteous people are full of charity. See, righteous people show mercy and they just give. You know, they don't allow people to, you know, they don't, they don't borrow. They just give. Like a number of verses about that, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. See, like, you know, what contrast does that stand in, you know, to 1 Timothy 6.10? See, the love of money is the root of all evil, but God loveth the cheerful giver. See, God loves people who give, you know, just out of their heart, you know, wanting to help people or... You know, that they give cheerfully because they want the ministry to go forward. You know, they want to give money to missions. You know, they want to give to church planners. 
you know, let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, you know, not because I have to, but because I get to. God loves a cheerful giver. See, that's real joy, you know, whenever we give to the work of God. And, and that's really not just money, you know, that's, uh, that's what a lot of people think of. Like we often say with this ministry, you know, what about giving God your time? Because there are lots of people, you know, they'll give money before they'll give their time. You know, there's certainly a lot of people that give to missions, but they would never go to the mission field themselves. You know, there are people who give you gas money to go visit in the neighborhood, but they wouldn't go themselves. You know, how about giving God cheerfully, you know, with our time? You know, cheerfully, you know, studying the Bible, you know, cheerfully praying. You know, see, that being where our joy is you know, where, where it is, and getting to pray, to study the Bible, to do spiritual things. You know, getting to go to the house of God and worship, getting to listen to preaching. You know, giving not grudgingly or necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. See, for... Uh, now we're going to go back yeah, to 1 Corinthians 13, out of 2 Corinthians, to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, starting in verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So like this here, you know, being during the time of Pentecost, like the Apostle Paul says, if I'm going to speak in tongues... But I don't have charity. I don't have anything. You know, I can say that I speak in tongues, but I'm not really filled with the Spirit of God. If I don't have charity, verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, and I have not charity, I'm nothing. See, if I don't have charity... I don't have anything. Of course, charity here in the Greek, that's the highest kind of love. You know, I can have all the knowledge of the world, of the Bible, and of theology and all, but I don't have charity. I'm nothing. And though I, verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burning, I'm not charity. It profiteth me nothing. They hear he's even talking about, you know, charity, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, yet he says, and have not charity. That means he's not doing it out of a right heart. See, that goes back to 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver, not just somebody giving of necessity, but out of a good heart. Like he says, I give my body to be burned, and I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Even if I'm willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ and be, uh, you know, and be whipped and punished and burnt, you know, for the sake of God, if I don't have the right kind of love in my heart, if I'm not doing it with the love out of my heart, it doesn't do me any good. See, verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. See, a real heart of charity suffers with people. A real heart of charity is kind. See, a real heart of charity doesn't envy, you know, the the contrast, you know, to the other part of this. A person with a real love for God, you know, doesn't envy, is not greedy. See, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. A person with a heart of charity isn't full of pride. <laughs> you know, that's certainly something a lot of, you know, independent Baptists, you know, need to get a hold of. As well, you know, with their pride, a person with a real heart of love isn't up here to other people. Like, oh, I'm, you know, Dr. So-and-so that does all this, that, and the other. You know, I'm, you know, greater than everybody else. A person with a real heart of charity is humble. Let's skip down to verse number 8 here. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Of course, there came a time, you know, whenever the Bible was completed. Like it says in verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Whenever the Bible was completed, you know, we no longer had the time of Pentecost. You know, whenever the Bible was completed, you know, the tongues ceased. You know, we never, you know, we know, we no longer use prophecies and, 
you know, half speaking in tongues, that was only for a limited time. You know, that was a sign, you know, to unbelievers, you know, to unbelieving Jews, that Jesus really was the Messiah. See, we no longer have that anymore. We no longer have the time of Pentecost. But see, charity never faileth. That's something that, you know, existed then. That's something that existed, of course, in the Old Testament. You know, from the beginning of time. You know, to the time whenever, you know, Jesus comes back. And, you know, our time on this, the time of this earth is done. Charity never fails. See, we no longer live during the time of Pentecost, but of all the things, though, that God had Paul pen here in this text, charity never faileth. The person with a real heart of love, you know, never fails. You know, that's something that will always exist. It's now continuing on here, starting to wind down some things in verse number 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. Let her see the righteous will be blessed. See, God will bless your righteousness like we were talking about, you know, kind of last week, I believe it was. Yes, we were talking more, you know, kind of like about persecution and things of that nature. You know, like how a lot of, you know, saved people, you know, we get afflicted here on the earth. You know, we get done, we get done wrong, you know, you know, by worldly people, by people in the world. But the righteous, though, you know, will be blessed. You know, that is God's destination for us. Psalm 512. For thy Lord will bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as with a shield. See, God's going to bless the righteous. Righteous people, you know, have favor. They have favor with God. You know, we have a providence with God, you know, that is favorable. Proverbs 3.32 For the forward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. See, righteous people, you know, they have a secret favor with God that nobody else has. See, there is a secret favor with God that righteous people have that other people don't. See, that is God, you know, preserving righteous people like we looked at last week. God will preserve the righteous. God will bless the righteous. There is a secret favor that righteous people have with God that other people don't. And finishing things up here, going back to the 37th Psalm, the last phrase there, verse 22, we see, For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. Letter D, the wicked will be cut off. Of course, we see that phrase often, like I hear in the Psalms, and like I think that might also be in, oh, like in Proverbs a couple of times. But the wicked, though, are going to be cut off. You know, that is their providence. If they die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, they're going to be cut off. They're not going to exist anymore. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 28 the hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Once again, righteous people are going to be glad. You know, God is their hope. God's always going to preserve them and take care of them. But that isn't so, though, for the wicked. You know, they're going to perish. Now, if you're lost, God made salvation easy. You don't have to perish. God loves you. He sent his only begotten son to die for you. If you're lost, God certainly can save you. And God made salvation easy. God's dealing with your heart about salvation. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in Him and repent of your sins. That repentance, that means you're willing to change the direction of your life and follow God. You just pray, Lord, please save me. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I want to go in the direction that you want me to go in. Please save me. Amen. And our email address is there if we can help you with that. You know, like in any way, if uh, you don't completely understand, you know, like uh, like everything about salvation, like, like lots of people don't, lots of people have questions, you know, that's why we put our email address there. If we can help you in any way, answer any questions that you might have, just send us an email. And we 
we'd be happy to help you in any way that we can. But God, though, made salvation for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, just give God your heart. You know, that's really what salvation is, giving God your heart. Say, ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, save you. Say, Lord, I give you my heart. I repent of my sins. I want to live for you now. That's all salvation is. But if we can help you in any way, just let us know. Thank you so much for being with us here today. It's great to have everybody here with us. Good things from the Word of God. Look forward to the next uh, a couple of verses there. Those are the, the kind of things that I really enjoy preaching about, like looking at verses uh, like verse 23. And so come back and be with us next week. As I said, we cut down on some things here, but we'll be back with our uh, midweek uh, with our uh, midweek revival preaching. Our uh, midweek revival preaching. Uh, that's what we're going to call it uh, for, for the time being. You know, we'll be uh, continuing, uh, like in the book of Haggai, like what we had been going over, like on our weekend study before the Bible Conference Revival, you know, that uh, we had a few weeks ago. So come back and be with us. We'll be praying for us. Of course, as we said, we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be back in our sign language class with the word Bible Institute, and we'll be giving our 18th alcohol lecture with Temperance Awakening. So be praying for us as we're certainly praying for everybody out there. And as I said, come on back and be with us. And for now, we'll close in prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the gifts of sin. Thank you for all that you've done. All the blessings that you've bestowed upon our hearts and lives. Thank you so much, Father, for allowing us to come and to meet over the cyberways and to get into your word. Thank you for that blessed promise, Lord, that you'll always preserve us. And thank you for saving us, Lord. And I thank you so much that you do still save sinners. And I pray if there is one lost, that you convict them and save them, that they'd reach out to us, that they'd give you their heart, and that they'd get saved, Lord, before it is eternally too late. And just help us all to live for you, to go in the direction you have us to go in. Just use us all for your honor and for your glory. And we'll certainly care for you all in all the praise for all of it. Because you're worthy of that and you alone. For it's in that blessed name of Jesus Christ we pray all these things. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for being well. So we'll see you next time. Until the day break and the shadows flee away. I am Dr. Coop and I love you and I appreciate you.